Good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing today? Hey, awesome. Well, let's all stand together and worship the Lord. I search the world. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise, the treasures of faith, are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you, God. There's nothing better than you, God. There's nothing, nothing is better. instruments play I just want to share this uh, psalm as we are in a rehearsal this morning I'm going to stop playing real quick and let them play uh, as we are in our rehearsal this morning I uh, this a psalm came to came to me as I was as we were rehearsing this because um, it's so good and it's in Psalms 27 and it says I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And I don't know where you're at specifically or individually today, but don't lose heart. No matter what your circumstance is, don't lose heart. The Psalm goes on to say, it says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And maybe there's someone or some of us in this room today that just need to wait on the Lord. Maybe we're not feeling it. That's okay. <laughs> Faith over feeling. I would have lost heart unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Some of us are mourning in this place. But the Lord is the one who turns our mourning into dancing. Because he is good. So let's go into this bridge with faith that he is the one that saves us, that he is the one that rescues us. No matter where you're at this morning, no matter what happened this week, give your praise to God. Give your praise to God. Let's sing this. You turn morning to dancing. 
You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn mourning. Just give it to the Lord. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves. You turn graves into garden. You turn bones into army. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one. Let's sing that again. You turn graves. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. Yes, you do, Lord. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than there's no one else before you, Lord. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Let's sing, there's no one. There's no one better. Oh, there's no one better than you, God. There's no one better than you, God. There's no one. No one is better than you. Amen, amen. You may be seated. There is only one who brings ultimate hope, brings ultimate peace, who brings ultimate satisfaction. It is him and him alone. And so as we are here to worship, we are here to be reminded that there is nothing, there's nothing better than him. So I, I hope that you're able to, to take that and to run with that in your heart, in your spirit, in your mind in your body, in all of those ways. And that you would engage this time of worship in a way that you are reminded of the God that you have, of the Savior that has been given, of the one that was slain for you that has offered you life because he is resurrected. This is our Jesus. And this is the chance you have to come into this place and be reminded that there is something that triumphs over all circumstances, and that is him. He is worthy. He is so good. So we are glad that you are here. My name is B.J. Donahue. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're glad that you've chosen to be here. Um, it is uh, something that I know that the Lord worked in getting you here, but you also chose to come in all of how that works. I know that you're supposed to be here this morning to meet with him, and so I'm I'm asking the Lord to minister to every one of us, even as we desire to come in here and minister to him, to praise him, that he would speak to us. Because we are described as his children, his family, the one to whom he reveals himself. And so 
I would invite you to do the same thing, to ask the Lord to speak to you, to reveal himself to you through his word, through a song, through prayer, whatever it happens to be, that the Lord, that you would expect the Lord to meet with you today, even as we hope and pray and expect for him to meet with us as a faith family. Uh, Pastor Eric and his family are out of town and they're on vacation. It is spring break. Is there any child in here not on spring break? Those, ho- those homeschool children stuck without spring break this week. Okay, at least it's next. Oh, you mean like, like, to- like tomorrow or like the next one? Okay, so it's coming. So when everybody else has to go back, you can laugh at them because you, now you're off. Is that what you're telling me? Okay, all right. Well, we have a lot of people that are out, um, that are on uh, or are planning to take trips. Um, It is a a nice time of the year to be able to take a break, Um, but we are preparing also for Easter next week, um, which is a time where we get to celebrate really what we celebrate every single week, that Jesus Christ is alive. Um, that, that is, that's why we're here today, and that's why we don't just come once a year. It's because Jesus Christ, when he rose, he didn't need to do it ever again. Uh, he is risen. He is the risen living Savior. Um, but we will celebrate that um, next week. Just as a reminder, there is no life group next week, um, and our service doesn't start at 1030. You'll be walking in awkwardly embarrassed sitting in the back because it will have already started at 10. So make sure that you plan to be here at 10 uh, for that. If you're participating, I know that uh, Jimmy has reached out to you um, and asked you to be there earlier than that, and so check your email if you have that. There are a couple of announcements that I do want to let you know about. If you have a bulletin, um, it has many of those in there. Um, If your child is going to camp this summer, check that. Youth is going to camp this summer. Uh, There is a youth and parent meeting uh, right after church upstairs in the youth lounge. It won't be too long, but uh, just some information about camp that's going to be passed on to you. Um, Women of the Word, that's a group that does different Bible studies. Uh, Mel Barber is in charge of that. They are going to be starting up uh, their next one that is in the bulletin. Uh, It says 2.30. They're actually going to delay the start time to 3. And so that's going to be on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock. And so if you're interested in learning more, uh, you can see Mel or you can just show up. I would think that they would welcome you uh, just to come on in. Um, And then also, uh, just uh, as an FYI, because of spring break, there are no Wednesday night activities this week. There's no men's breakfast on Saturday No lunch bunch. Remember, lunch bunch for this month, we are taking the trip down to uh, Porter Memorial Baptist in Lexington as a part of that uh, KBC-sponsored event. That information is in there. We do need you to sign up so we can let you know about that. And then there is an insert, uh, a couple inserts in your bulletin, one for all of the pretty flowers. Please know if you bought one of these flowers in either... um, in either... Uh, honor of someone or memory of someone, that those are yours to take home after next weekend. So please do that. Please take that home. Otherwise, we have like lilies sitting everywhere in our church, um, longing to be in your home and not here. Um, So please do that. And then the other one is disaster training. Um, You may have heard uh, we had uh, more tornadoes. Um, There were some in the south a couple weeks ago, and then just yesterday... Uh, we had, or Friday, I guess, into yesterday, um, we had several tornadoes that, that uh, struck. I think there were 26 people that, that died in those most recent ones. And the Kentucky Baptists uh, do a great job of mobilizing help to go to those areas. Um, but they do that as a part of a certified group that's trained to do that. And so if you're interested in being a part of those groups that go Um, there's going to be a training, and the nice thing is one of those is like right where we are. Um, Burlington is right around the corner. Um, April 22nd, there is a $30 fee for that training, um, but you can go online and sign up for that. Um, I know Bob Smith has talked about this in the past. The missions team has talked about uh, getting involved in this. This is a great way um, for you to be the hands and feet of Jesus on the ground in the midst of disaster. Um, Whether you're on the chainsaw team or whether you're going to love on people or just do whatever is needed. Um, I can tell you uh, when we went through the tornadoes in 2012 here in northern Kentucky, um, you just need people 
You just need people. Um, and that is pouring out the love of Jesus when we get to do it in his name. And so that's an op- opportunity for you. Other things in the bulletin, um, if you're a, a visitor with us, man, we're glad you're here. Uh, hopefully you got a, a guest bag and uh, learned some information about our church. We'd love to get to know you. Um, so you can fill out that card that's either in the bag or tear off the perforated uh, thing in the bulletin. Just give us a little information that we can minister to you and your family. We are here we get to worship because we have a God who's worthy. And so let's pray. Father, thank you that we come into this place reminded of truth. Uh, regardless of our week, regardless of our circumstances, whether they be the lowest of the low or whether they be the highest of the high, all things still pale in comparison to the glory and greatness that you have. And so we come into this place to have our perspective aligned with who you are, the truth that we can rest our hearts in, um, the anchor that you declare yourself to be, the God who is sitting on the throne because you are not scurrying around, you are not fretting, but you are at complete peace because you are working in and through all circumstances. Lord, we don't understand all of that. And Lord, we would then say we can't have peace in that. And yet you give us your peace because you have overcome. And so today, we come to meet with you once again. The one who has overcome. The one who offers life. Jesus, our Savior. Thank you for everything that we have. And may today be about you. In Jesus' name, amen. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Let's do that again. Lord, now indeed I find thy power in thine alone. Can change the leper spots and melt this heart of stone. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left. The crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died. My soul to say, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Oh, pray. 
my mind to Calvary where Jesus fled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise, O Lord, O Lord our God. Then on the third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trampled death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ.
shall return in robes of white, the blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Praise the name. You are our Lord, the Lord, strong and mighty. We love you and we give you praise this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a passage in Romans chapter 1 that I want to use for our time of scripture and prayer. The book of Romans is one of those theological treatises meaning it's one of those ones where the heavy stuff is, where he makes sure that we have a big picture. And you go through the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans and you see a glorious picture um, unveiled. I know, uh, I think the Salt Life Group is working their way slowly through uh, each and every verse. Still in Romans chapter 8? Amen. Camp for a long time. But I want to go back to Romans chapter 1. Because as we consider our world and the things that we face, starting in verse 18, we have this picture of a world that's broken. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through that which is made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But in 
But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds, and of four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. We just sang a song, oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Right? When we take our praise off of God, it has to go somewhere. It has to go somewhere and be on something. And in the book of Romans, we see this um, kind of progression of if it goes there, it's going to go somewhere else. It's going to go somewhere else. It's going to go somewhere else because they're seeking satisfaction only God alone can provide. And joy and delight and contentment. And so God gives them over and gives them over and gives them over. And ultimately you get down to verse 28. And listen what it says. Just as they did not see it fit to acknowledge God any longer. What an indictment. God gave them over to a depraved mind. To do those things which are not proper. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They're gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil. And get this one, disobedient to parents. Just in case we were listening. Just thrown in there in the midst of that. And then it goes on to say, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but give hearty approval to those who practice them. This past Monday, we had a, a shooting down in Nashville. And I will tell you, I, it took me until, in, in part because I didn't do a lot of research, but it took me until Thursday until I figured out even who the, the shooter was. Because I was told it was a man, then I was told it was a woman, then I was, I was confused. I didn't know which one was which. And ultimately, it's a, a female who identifies as a man who went in, and um, whether it was specifically the school because of connections with it, whether it was this one or another place that they had intended to go, but there was a shooting done. And the loss of lives where we have a, a church now where a pastor is meeting and one of those that were shot was um, his own child, nine-year-old child, and now he has to stand in the pulpit and speak to his people who are hurting over the whole thing and he is self, himself is hurting over the loss of his daughter. But as I, as I reflect on all of this, the same, I think it was the exact same day, the Wall Street Journal came out with an article that talked about how um, they did a poll, and those things that were um, significant in previous generations, whether that was patriotism or faith or even uh, children, the view towards children in our country, things that have been mainstays for a long time, were kind of being the, the percentage of people that valued those things was declining rapidly. And so you have a culture that's walking away from scripture that's walking away from the word walking away from god and then we're asking the question why are these things happening and we want to go external to gun control and all those kinds of things and there's proper conversation to be had but at the root of that it's not a gun and at the root of that it's not um, whatever other thing you want to blame at the heart of it is the heart of man and as man clears out a position of God in his life where he's no longer praising the name of the Lord our God, they seek for something to fill it. And when that satisfaction isn't found, they go to something else. Or, hopeless, they lash out that they've never found it. We have a God who allows us to see the folly of our ends. And he gives us over. We say, no, no, we want this. This will really make us happy. And God says, I don't think it will. I know it won't. But I will give you over to it. Almost as a, as a judgment that you want to pursue those things. 
You will not find contentment. You will not find those things because they are found in me alone. We as the church have got to be doing, I will say, a better job of living out the gospel. We have a, an opportunity. There will be persecution. That, that school, those children probably had nothing to do with this other person. They were arbitrary people to that person. And they, as far as they know, there weren't particular targets. They left everybody else alone and only went for these six. But that reality is that there is a world that needs the love of Christ, the truth of Christ. And it needs the church just to continue to be the church. That the power of God can come through the gospel. The preached message, the taught message, the lived out message, the fruit of the spirit lived out in our lives. We have hope. We have something that transcends all of it. And so I want to invite you right now, as we think about our nation, and we think about that church particularly and that school, would you, would you pray for them? Would you lift up that pastor as he seeks to lead? Would you pray for that church and that school as they try to figure out what the next steps forward are? Would you pray for the church in America, including yourselves? As we head towards Easter, we have a message of hope. We have a message of reconciliation. We have a message of peace. We have a message of joy. Even as we face the cross, that God was so inclined to love us that he put his son on the cross on our behalf. This is not simply out there. Every one of us can relate to circumstances that are going on. Things that are probably affecting your own family. And so maybe that's something that the Lord puts on your heart right now to pray for as well. A circumstance where the gospel needs to shine in. Whether it's in your family, whether it's in this church, whether whatever. We are not immune. We all need the gospel. And we need it to continue to be the centerpiece of everything that we do. So I invite you to take a moment. Would you pray as the Lord leads you in prayer? Father, as we pray, I ask that you would even help us understand how to pray. Lord, we can come with judgmental prayers asking for you to, to rain down, to, to condemn those. We can come as scared children, terrified that we might be next. But Father, we can also come as your children who are confident in our risen Savior, who directs paths, who understands that in this world we will have trouble and tribulation. And as those imprisoned in the book of Acts said, as they were released, that they would pray for boldness to continue to share the gospel, that you would give us the grace to be people who take seriously the message of Jesus Christ, the cross, the resurrection, and the hope that is found there. God, we pray for this church. We pray that you would minister to it even as it is together in grieving, that you would speak truth, that you would press out fear, with your love and your grace, that you would allow the gospel to remind us that we look not to this world for our hope and our satisfaction and our contentment and our peace, but we ultimately look to a place that is kept perfected, held um, unfading for us with you in your presence because of what Jesus Christ has done. 
Father, I pray for our church. Lord, as we continue to be called to live out the gospel, that you would help me to do that well. That we would set our minds on the things that are of utmost importance and significance and that we would make time to have those kind of conversations and those kinds of interactions. Lord, as people gather for Easter, as they gather for Easter egg hunts and being together for family meals, that the gospel would be something that we would have opportunity to share and to live out before them. Lord, as we talk about issues in our workplaces, in our schools, that you would give us the grace to be able to see things from your perspectives and speak into those things in a way that is um, honoring to you and bringing attention to you. God, would you help us to be a people that hold tight to this word, that trust in you alone, that take joy in living out this relationship that you've invited us to, that you have paid such a great price for us to enjoy, that you have bestowed upon us the riches of your grace in Christ. May nothing in this world steal that joy. May nothing in this world take away that hope. And instead, may we live in a, in a way that is unshakable so that the world takes notice, that we would shine like stars in a wicked and perverse generation, as Paul would say it in the book of Philippians. We would shine like stars. God, help us. Help us to see the end of all these things that are futile. To not, to not engage ourselves in them, but to be people who would speak through them to offer hope. In Jesus' name, amen. The week of his crucifixion, Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem. The events that follow will literally change the world. He rides through the crowd, not on a white horse, but on a borrowed donkey. The people bow down, shout Hosanna, and wait for his next move. The crowds not only place palm branches at his feet, but they also place on his shoulders their own expectations of a conquering king who will overthrow Rome. Jesus will not only disappoint them, he will disrupt them and will shatter their assumptions about power and justice. You're invited into a moment of reset and discovery because the events around the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus are the absolute answer to every longing heart. May God give us eyes to see. You have your Bibles if you would open them to chapter 27 of Matthew. It is Palm Sunday. We have, in the Gospel of Matthew, already covered Palm Sunday, and we are headed to the resurrection next week, which means that we have the crucifixion this morning to wrestle with and to have our hearts hopefully be once again um, softened and moved by. To set the stage, we have been walking through these last days with Jesus, and he has led the disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane where he prayed, and Judas has now met him and given him that kiss, and they have taken him. Peter has been challenged in his beliefs as he's walked um, from afar and watched what has been happening to Jesus as he's brought before the religious leaders. The rooster has crowed. He has gone out and wept bitterly. Judas has seen it and taken his own measures in dealing with his remorse. And so now we pick back up in the story in verse 11 as Jesus stands before Pilate. So if you have your place, if you would stand, 
We'll read down to verse 54. So Jesus stood before the governor. And the governor questioned him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And he did not answer him with regard to even a single charge. So the governor was quite amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the people any one prisoner whom they wanted. At that time, they were holding a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that because of envy, they had handed him over. So while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, Have nothing to do with that righteous man. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. But the governor said to them, so which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, crucify him. He said, why? What evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more saying, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. And all the people said, His blood shall be on us and our children. And he released Barabbas for them. But after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. So the soldiers of the governors took Jesus into the praetorium, and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. They stripped him, and they put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him. They took the reed and began to beat him on the head. After they had mocked him, They took the scarlet robe off him and put on his own garments back on him and led him away to crucify him. As they were coming out, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon, whom they pressed into service to bear his cross. When they came to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall. And after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among them, them, among themselves by casting lots. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And above his head, they put up the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now. If he delights in him, for he said, I am God's son, or the son of God. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Some who were standing there, when they heard it, began saying, This man's calling for Elijah. 
Immediately one of them ran, and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him a drink. But the rest of them said, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, Truly this was the Son of God. Let me pray with me. Father, our words on a page, a story we have heard, may you let us sit in it for just a moment today to be reminded. May it spur our hearts. May it stir our convictions. May it warm us to your great love and sacrifice. I thank you for Jesus Christ, whom we have sung about. I thank you for this Savior who has given his life as a ransom for many. For the things that he willingly subjected himself to. Saying, your will be done. May it be done even now in this place as we gather in Jesus' name. Amen. Sentenced to die. It's a rough weekend when this is the passage that you're preaching because this is a heavy weekend. It is the centerpiece of all that we believe. The Old Testament was pointing to this one who would come. The New Testament is the story of the one who came. The purpose that he came was very clear. In the Old Testament, it was to out... um, do all those who had tried to, in some ways, be a picture of him. For man in himself cannot restore himself and cannot live life in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. And so we have picture after picture of those who come so close but fall so far. And ultimately in Christ we have one who is all of those pictures put together and then perfect indeed. And so we walk through this account This morning, first thing we see is the final trial. Jesus comes to Pilate. Pilate is the latest in a series of governors that have been appointed by Rome after Herod Archelaus was disposed of in AD 6. Pilate was in his position from AD 26 to AD 36, so this would have been right in the middle likely, of his time. The one who appointed him was, um, as one commentator put, doing this man no favors because Jerusalem and Israel was not a place that uh, was like, you know you've made it when. This was the rebellious people out there in the middle of nowhere that no one liked and no one wanted to be around who constantly got into trouble. Pilate found himself in a precarious position. He was supposed to be loyal to Caesar, and at the same time, he was to pacify these Jews enough so that they wouldn't get him in trouble with Rome. This was a a difficult task. And so Pilate is the one before whom Jesus is now brought. Caiaphas has asked him a poignant question, are you the son of God? And Jesus has said, it is as you say, but Pilate's question is a different question because he is thinking it from a political position. And so his question is not, are you the son of God? He has no concern for such matters, but are you the king of Israel? That's a different story. But Jesus uses the exact same phrase again that he used with Judas, that he used with Caiaphas, and now with Pilate. The only difference is it's in the present tense instead of the past tense, as in you're saying it. Jesus is both of these things. 
he answers to Caiaphas, he answers to Pilate. His identity is indeed sure and known and understood by him even as he faces these moments. In Pilate's questionings and Jesus' affirmation, the gospel of Matthew is now bookended nicely. Matthew started with some magi showing up asking, where is him who has been born king of the Jews? And as he now goes to the cross, Pilate is asking, are you the king of the Jews? It ends with this final declaration of his royalty. But Jesus does not answer him even a single word. He was told that he would be a, like a, le- a sheep led to slaughter. He opened not his mouth. Pilate's words could be translated, you do hear, don't you? And Matthew's answer for that is that he not even a word in response. Pilate offers a deal to get Jesus out of it, believing that the people would denounce their leader's envy. And so he offers up to them someone called Barabbas. Barabbas versus Jesus. They couldn't be more different. Barabbas, a notorious criminal, one who was rightly to be condemned as an insurrectionist, as a murderer, as one who incites riots, His name means son of a father. In the purest of earthly senses, he's a man. He is the son of man. He is the people. Jesus is the son of God. And you have this picture sat before the people and man chooses man. And chooses once again to denounce God. God gives us this reminder even in the names given. Next thing I want to see is this, the verdict rendered. Pilate, while he's going through this, uh, gets a, a, a text message from his wife. Don't mess with this man. You, you can see, Pilate's already seeing the setup And now his wife is adding to it. He's in a situation at this point. He looks at the people, but while he's, I guess, checking his messages, the chief priests have stirred up the people. And so he comes to them and asks them, who do you prefer? They say, Barabbas. He He asks, and they say, Barabbas. He says, then what do I do with this Jesus? Almost allowing them to be the one who pronounces this verdict of guilty. Crucify him, they say. And I am so grateful for verse 23. It says, Pilate said, why? What evil has he done? And guess what? They cannot answer him. There is not an answer given. All it says is, but they kept shouting all the more, saying, crucify, crucify. The answer can't be given. There isn't an answer. There is no evil that he has done. The only thing they could have said was, nothing, we just don't like him, so get rid of him. He was the spotless, sinless Lamb of God, positioned and qualified in His person to take upon Himself the sin of the world. There was no one like Jesus. There was nothing that rightly condemned Him except yours and my sin that He bore. The verdict is actually a bad title for this spot because there isn't one actually given. He's never declared guilty. He's just sentenced. Pilate sees that he's accomplishing nothing. The riot has started, and the last thing he wants to do is be in the middle of that during a festival time with a lot of people there. A lot of pilgrims that have descended that could go back and say, you should be in Jerusalem. It's crazy there. That's the last thing he needs happening as he's trying to navigate the waters politically. 
What Pilate feared more than accidentally killing an innocent man was accidentally starting a crowd riot. And so he chose. He chose to try to pass the blame, giving Jesus over to death, which would only be legally authorized by him. It makes good to release this one called Barabbas. His words, see to that yourself, closely mirror the same words that the religious leaders said to Judas when he showed back up with the money. See to it yourself. So much parody in this. While there was some overlap in the crowd of those maybe chanting Hosea or Hosanna on Palm Sunday, this crowd is probably more native to Jerusalem at this point. One commentator wrote this, To the extent, though, that the crowds did overlap, one must recall their quite different Messianic expectations, now almost certainly destroyed by seeing Jesus imprisoned. They had high hopes on Sunday, but now to see him in the courts, they were denouncing him. The crowds and the leaders accept the responsibility of Jesus' death, believing it better that one should die for the sake of the nation than the whole nation perish. And they say, the blood be upon us and our children. What an incredible moment. And so then we get to the horrific execution, verse 27. Part of the, uh, the crucifixion process was the humiliation and the pain which preceded the actual nailing to the tree. The scourging, one person wrote, was often in itself historically more fatal than the crucifixion. It would often end up killing the people before they made it to the cross. It employed a metal-tipped whip or bone-tipped whip in which they used to repeatedly rip into the bare flesh of the victim's back. The soldiers knew the charges. They knew that he said himself to be the king of the Jews, and so they give him a, um, a purple robe. They give him a reed in his hand to look like a scepter, and then they place upon him a crown of thorns. What an image for just a moment. Going back to the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve blow it, and the ground is cursed, that which is born out of the ground are mosquitoes, flies, and gnats, but also thorns and thistles. The thorns were pictures of sin, the evidence of sin. And here you take the thorns and you place it physically on his head, symbolically reminding us and giving us a picture of the Messiah that would bear the sin of the world. This moment was certainly very physically demanding. And so pressed into helping was a man named Siren, or Simon of Cyrene. I can't imagine what he was going through in that moment. He was there for his own reasons, probably to perform his own religious duties. May have traveled in for the festival, observing the Passover. Potentially caught up in what's going on, trying to see what's happening on the street. And all of a sudden is yanked in and now must carry the crossbar that the typical one being crucified would be expected to carry to where they would be crucified ultimately. They reached the place of Golgotha, the place of the skull because of the way that the rock formations appeared. They give him a drink. And there's conflicting um, kind of ideas of why that drink was given. Some believe that it was given, it was actually a poison that it would be that much more painful for the person. And then others believed it to be something that kind of took the edge off in the midst of it. So it was a kind of a, a, a moment of grace. But regardless, when Jesus is exposed to it, he denies it. 
And so if he were being shown a little mercy, he says, no, I will be fully conscious for everything that's going to happen in these moments. I will not allow my mind or my body to not feel and to not experience what I am laying down on my behalf for you. He is unwilling to drink it, unwilling to re- to take anything that might curb the pain or agony that he might experience the full force of man's and God's wrath. Crucifixion. I have a quote that I want to put up on the screen. Crucifixion, one writer wrote, undoubtedly one of the most gruesome forms of torture and death humans have ever invented. It involved prolonged suffering for up to several days. The final cause of death was usually asphyxiation or suffocation since the victim finally became too weak to lift his head far enough off his chest to even gasp for for air. The writer goes on to say this, it's almost inconceivable that believers who frequently meditate on Jesus' sufferings on their behalf could exalt themselves or quarrel with each other. The ground is indeed level at the foot of the cross. That God should send his son to die for us was the scandal of the Christian message in the first century and remains so for many today. Today we seek out the most humane way we could kill someone, giving them several drugs to kind of just slowly put them to sleep and stop the body from functioning. The Romans in no way were interested in that. In fact, they would mount these crucifixes in the entrances of the city, as I said, so that people would see it. Passers-by would understand what insurrection looks like. And the, fuel, the, fu- the full fury of a Roman empire when it comes down on you. So Jesus is crucified. His garments are divided among those watching over him. The reason for his crucifixion is posted like customarily done in his case saying the king of the Jews He has others that are crucified alongside him. And then there are guards sat to watch over him. I wonder what the guards were thinking. Were they curious that anything at all would happen? Would the disciples revolt and come and try to take him down and rescue him? Would Jesus actually come off of the cross? Would something else happen? Or was this just going to be another ordinary day of more guys claiming to be things that they weren't? Or doing things that they should never have. Jesus hanging crucified. But it wasn't enough just to be crucified. The intensified sentence. As he is serving out this death penalty on the cross. Everybody joins in. In beating him up. No longer physically but now. Emotionally and verbally. Those passing by, hurling abuse at him. Religious leaders adding to it. Listen to the insults. These are the repeated charges and accusations that have been made against him. Destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. This was brought against him during the trial. The Son of God. If you are the Son of God. Wow, that goes all the way back to Matthew chapter 4 and Satan. He saves others. He cannot save himself. King of Israel, one who trusts in God as the Son of God. I I just want you to hear for just a moment. There's no confusion over who Jesus is and why he's on the cross. Look at the insults that they're shooting at him. Now, they're saying them in a mocking way, but what it gives evidence of is that he's not just a random guy on a cross. He's there for a reason. He's been doing things. He's been saying things. And people have all of these things about him. What they are choosing to reject is not that he's some random guy, but that he is who he says he is. Today, we 
get a lot more confused about who Jesus is. Is he a good moral teacher? Is he just a guy that lived a couple thousand years ago? They knew who they were crucifying. They knew the words that he had said. They knew the things that he had done. They did not deny the miraculous. They just denied the fact that it was done on Saturday and it shouldn't be. Mounts wrote this. As they challenged him to come down from the cross, Mounts wrote, it was the power of love, not nails, that kept him there. And so now, darkness falls on the land until the ninth hour. And at this point, it, we kind of understand this, that the wrath of God descends. The, the sin of man is fully placed upon Christ, and Christ identifies with us as sinner. He became sin who knew no sin. This is that moment in which he now is sin and God's wrath is poured out on Christ. The separation becomes very real. The first three hours on the cross, he's subjected to the wrath and the judgment of man. But these last three hours when the, the sky turns dark, he's subjected to the wrath and judgment of his father. He cries out to him, quoting from Psalm 22. Why have you forsaken me? And while he obviously knows the answer, he doesn't stop the question in the midst of the pain and suffering. The condemnation felt after a beautiful life of ministry and a perfect reflection of the Father, the Son is no longer in step with his dad. Instead, he is now the embodiment of all that the Father hated and the object upon which the Father would take out his righteous indignation. And so Jesus is on a cross, hanging for us. And then the apparent end. Verse 50, Jesus cries out again with a loud voice and yields up his spirit. We have pictures now of things that start to happen. Pictures of the reconciliation that is taking place. Matthew records some of the supernatural events that take place as Jesus has given up his spirit. It says that the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That would either be through the court of the Gentiles or the Holy of Holies. One showing that all man was the same and had opportunity to come before the Father or that the Father was breaking down the barrier between himself and mankind. Either pictures are beautiful pictures of the restoration process. The earth shook. A divine work upon the creation. The creation itself affected by the cross of Christ. One day to be completely made new without the power or presence of sin and the curse of the sin. The tombs are open. Matthew is the only one who records this. Saints are raised. It says that this happens after the resurrection. So they come in and are testifying to a resurrected Lord. And you have a centurion then at the end who sees everything that's happened. And with those around him, they look at this one and they say, surely this was the Son of God. The death of Jesus Christ. It is that which Paul will center everything about in his ministry. That in Christ there is forgiveness of sin. That in Christ there is redemption. That in Christ's death on the cross there is reconciliation. It is because of the cross that you and I have any hope or can come into this room and have any peace with God. Because Jesus Christ died in your place and took upon all of this for you and for me. That is what we remember Easter weekend. Is that Jesus has truly paid it all. Two applications. 
First one is this. Take time this week to remember the cross. As the writer said, it's almost inconceivable that believers who frequently meditate on Jesus' sufferings on their behalf could exalt themselves or quarrel with each other. I just think of that line. If we but thought of the sacrifice paid, it would render all things in light of it much weaker. Take time to remember the cross. But I want you to do something more than that, and that is to take time this week to consider the greater significance of the cross. And I have heard messages preached where all of the points of the cross are just focused on, and it makes us really be there, right? Like the passion of the Christ and the seeing uh, that one hanging on the cross, the blood coming down. I mean, I've, I've had a message um, if you want to go here, Cameron Mills has an incredible one. He even brings out a lamb and like is going to cut it and doesn't do it. But like he can get a lot of you freaking out really quick. And there's a lot of emphasis on this idea of what the cross felt physically. But I just want to take you back for a moment. Go to verse 35. It says, And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. They spent more ink. Matthew spent more ink on they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots than he went into all the details of the crucifixion. That is the line. And when they, they don't even put it in present tense, like, and they crucified him. He just says, and when they had crucified him. Sometimes we are so focused on the physical part of the crucifixion and we, we think about all the pain and we, we respond to the pain that Jesus has gone through on our behalf, but we forget that, that if you want to put the pain of the physical reality of the cross against the spiritual reality of the pain of judgment, of facing and being separated from the Father, those are nowhere near equal in comparison. And Matthew is certainly giving credence to the other. That's the attention. It's the separation between God and man and the thing that, that Jesus is doing by being on the cross in the first place. It's why we have the Garden of Gethsemane in that moment. It wasn't simply that he was going to be crucified. Hundreds of, of men have been crucified, but none of them took upon the sin of the world for you. That was the big deal. Those men failed in confronting Rome. Here Jesus was standing before you before the Heavenly Father. Take some time this week to recognize what has been given you in Jesus. Over and over again, this, this passage references or alludes to Psalm 22. Where Words say this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. By night I have no rest, yet you are holy, and you are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with their lips. They wag their heads, saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue, because he delights in you. This is Psalm 22. Yet... You are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breast. Upon you I, have cast, I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. There is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouths at me as a ravaging and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It melts within me. My strength is dried up. My tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers have encompassed me. They've pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look. They stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothes, they cast lots. That's Psalm 22. 
It's living out in Matthew 27. And the beauty of Psalm 22 is it comes right before Psalm 23. You have a Savior who has made restoration with the Father so that we want for nothing, so that we will dwell with him for all eternity. This, your Savior, has died for you. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. May it be fresh and anew today. May we be grateful for it. May it never grow old. May we never go beyond it. May we never overlook it and simply run to the resurrection. May we see ourselves in those very moments so that we would be able to say that he himself took on our sin in his body on the cross, that we would die to sin and live to righteousness, for by our stripes he makes us healed. That we would be able to respond and say that the love of Christ compels me, knowing that one has died for all, that we would have the opportunity now to live on his behalf. Father, I thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who took on the judgment that we owed, put that on himself on the cross, suffered not only the physical, but suffered the spiritual separation so that we might be restored. God, would you draw us to yourself even this week as we prepare our hearts for Easter. May we celebrate Good Friday. May we celebrate our Savior who died to give his life as a ransom for many. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, may that be the echo of our hearts and our minds as we leave this place. Would we go out as the aroma of Christ because you have transformed our lives. We have forgiveness. We have grace. We have mercy. We have hope and redemption. We have reconciliation to you. May we live that out this week. Give us opportunities. Show us moments of conversation, of ways that we can minister that hope and that truth even as we prepare for this weekend's celebration of the resurrection. May the cross be so difficultly sweet as we embrace your love and our forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.